Hey everyone, my name is Matt. This is my son JR. This is my wife Lindsay. She's here making sure that JR stays happy for this part of the video. <laughs> Welcome to his nursery. In this video, I'm going to show you how I made this walnut and maple crib. So the frame parts are all made from walnut and the spindles are made from maple. The frame rises from the front to the back, so the side is inclined, and the spindles themselves are tapered from the center out to their ends. The crib can also disassemble because the front and the back rails are pinned to the legs with brass rods. And the height of the mattress can be lowered as the baby gets older. So let's get started. So I just laid out the rails and these two boards are book matched. So they were sequentially cut from the same log. And they are cut, you can see the pith here, this is a bit of the pith in walnut. It's got this spongy pith in it. So that's the center of the tree, so that means that to the left and right of the pith in this orientation of the cut. This is going to be mostly all quarter sawn and maybe a little bit of rift sawn. So this is going to be some nice really straight grain for my rails, which is exactly what I'm looking for. I want those to be nice, straight, uh, even grain. So I was able to lay these out and get the lower and the upper rails for the entire thing, the entire crib all the way around. Um, up here, the pith is actually off-center in this direction here so I have my wider lower rails on this side of the line and my narrower up, uh, upper rails on this side and then down here the pith kind of flips around so the wider section is over here and that becomes my lower and then the upper is narrower over there. I'll start the milling process by ripping the rail stock out of the boards. I label the end of each pair so I can keep them together as a pair. I also remove the inch or so of waste from each board to get them closer to their final width. For the leg stock, you might remember the slab of walnut that I used to make the bassinet. I ended up with a perfectly sized offcut to get the stock for both the legs. By having the legs come out of one block like this, I was able to have book matched leg stock. It's a subtle detail, but just like the rails, I like subtleties. <laughs> I left the roughly ripped stock for a few days to de-stress before milling them flat into thickness. The boards for the rails ended up being very stable. After sitting around for about a week after their initial milling, they hadn't moved. So instead of milling them down thinner, I left them at their current thickness of around 7 eighths of an inch thick. The legs needed a little bit of work and those ended up at 1 3 quarter inches thick. I ripped all the lower rails to 5 and a half inches wide and the upper rails to 3 and a half inches wide. I also ripped the legs at 3.5 inches wide. The front legs are cut to 36 inches long and the rear legs are cut to 42 inches long. I'm going to start with the side assembly joinery. So I cut the lower side rails to length. The upper rails are angled so I'll cut them to length as I work through the joinery. I made the shoulder cuts for the tenons on the ends of the lower rails and then to help me set up to figure out the upper rail I removed some material from the tenon area to create a rabbit. That rabbit allows me to set the lower rail between the legs, which gives me the actual distance that the legs will be apart. Now I can set the upper rail exactly into position and copy the exact angle that the upper rail's shoulder will need to be cut to. I cut that angle on one end and then I can start to lay out the angled tenon. I come over one inch from the end and using my bevel gauge, strike the shoulder line. Then I'll carry the line across the edges with a square and switching back to the bevel gauge to complete the shoulder line on the other face. Before I start cutting the tenons, I cut the mortises in the legs. These mortises are a half inch wide. To start forming my tenons, I use an off cut from the rails to set the height of the dado stack. I shoot for something that's just a little tight so I can finesse it later. For the upper rails, I swing the miter gauge to roughly the correct angle and make the cut staying a little away from my scribe shoulder line, which I then chop back to at the bench with my chisels. Now to get the perfect shoulder to shoulder length, I place the upper rail between the legs, again referencing off one completed shoulder. I'll cut this one to length and lay out and cut the tenon the same way as I did on the other end of this rail. I then finish fitting the tenons to the mortises in the side assemblies. 
Before moving on to the long rails, I filled a few defects with some epoxy and tint. I cut the tenon slightly oversized with the dado stack. A couple of cleanup passes with the shoulder plane makes them fit perfectly to the mortise. Next I'll do a little cleanup work at the base of the shoulder and then cut the tenon to length. The last detail on the frame is to add the taper to the bottom of the legs. These don't have to be perfectly identical, so I just follow the line at the bandsaw and clean them up with a hand plane. Now onto the spindles. I grabbed these maple boards and laid out the two different lengths that I'm going to need. I rough cut them to length, jointed them flat, and planed them to thickness. I ended up at a finished thickness of 15 16 of an inch. Next I go through and rip all the boards into square stock for the spindles. The finished crib is going to require 50 spindles and I made about 56 spindle blanks just in case. To create consistently tapered spindles, I'm going to use a router and a jig on my lathe. The jig is really simple to make. I wanted the spindles to go from a full thickness of 15 16 in the middle to a half inch 11 inches from the middle for the shorter spindles so for a total length of 22 inches. So laying out the curve on this piece of OSB, the curve would be zero relative to the edge in the middle and drop down 7 seconds of an inch, 11 inches out from the center line. 7 seconds of an inch is half the difference between 15 16 and 1 half of an inch. And it's half because I'm dealing with the radius of the spindle instead of its diameter on this jig. Once I have those three points laid out, I can draw a curve. I just bent a piece of brass rod and had my wife trace the curve for me and we carried this curve past the end marks. I can then cut the curve out of the bandsaw and sand back to the line. I can then make a copy which will become the back of the jig. Nothing fancy with the assembly, I just screwed some connecting pieces that were roughly the width of the lathe bed to the front and back to create a box. I then made a notch on both ends so the drive center and tail center can go into the jig. And lastly, I screwed on some strips of plywood to the top to act as a platform for my router. I used a guide bearing in my router, so I spaced these strips apart accordingly. Here you can see the other jig I made out of melamine for the longer spindles. Now I can plop the jig on the lathe and clamp it to the ways. Now creating the spindles was pretty mindless. I just had to run the router back and forth. The hardest part about this was finding a good lathe speed, cut depth, and feed speed that would produce the smoothest cut without the router bit catching or tearing a chunk out of the spindle. I found that running the lathe at 1400 RPM, taking shallow passes while moving the router slowly towards the ends worked best until the last spindle that I accidentally ran the lathe in reverse, which dramatically improved the cut quality. You can see that I also added some screws sticking out of the top of the jig to stop the router before it contacts the tailstock. To set the final plunge depth, I use a half inch wrench to check the spindle's diameter at the point where it will be intersecting the crib's rail. I'm aiming for it to be a little larger so when I clean up the spindle next, the diameter ends up at or slightly above a half inch. Here's what the spindles look like after the routing. The router leaves a textured surface and the center isn't completely round yet. I cleaned up the surface and brought the spindle to its final diameter with 60 grit sandpaper. So 
so after a minute and a half of sanding, here's how the spindle looks. Now I'll start working up the grits, but before I move on, I spend a moment sanding with the grain. So now on to 80, 120, 150, and lastly 180. Now back to the rails to lay out and drill the holes for the spindles. The side rails are a little more interesting than the front and back rails since the upper rail is angled. I use a marking gauge to scribe a center line and use a pair of dividers to divide out the edge of the lower rail so that the space between each spindle is the same, including the space between the last spindles and the legs. To transfer the hull locations to the upper rail, I butt the shoulders of both rails up against the straight edge so they are in the same orientation they would be when attached to legs, just closer together. I can then use a square to transfer the hole locations to the upper rails. And I'll transfer the locations from the face to the edge. To drill the holes in the upper rail, I use a bevel gauge to transfer the angle to the drill press. Then I can just go down the line and drill all the holes. Next I'll be working on getting the spindles to the correct length since they get shorter as they move towards the front of the side assembly. I'll use a caliper to find the point on the spindle that's a half inch and I'll mark a quarter inch down from that point. This is where I'll make one of the cuts. Now for the other end. I made the story stick to mark the total length of each spindle in the assembly. Now after I cut this end, the spindle diameter is going to be more than a half an inch. So I'll use my dowel plate to form a half inch tenon on that end of the spindle. The front and back assemblies are far less exciting because everything there is square. The most interesting part was cutting the spindles to length, which I did with this double stop block setup. Now I can get ready to start applying the finish, so I take the assembled crib apart. As I'm removing the spindles, I number them so I can put them back in the same order. The order on the front and back really shouldn't matter, but who knows. Next I'll lay out for the holes that will receive the brass rod, which will pin the tenons and allow me to disassemble the crib for storage. And I just drill these all the way through with the 3 8 inch Forstner bit. Then I can do a final sanding on all the frame parts and break all the edges and corners. For the finish on the frame, I'm using salable finish. Putting the tenons up on blocks allows me to easily apply finish to all sides. and then I can do the legs. I put on three coats of finish, sanding between the coats with 600 grit sandpaper. For the spindles, I'm using a water-based poly and a spray can. I went with a water-based finish for these to keep the maple as white as possible. Unfortunately, this finish ended up yellowing quite a bit despite looking all right on my sample piece. These spindles were easy to spray by using some blocks of wood with holes drilled in them to hold the spindles. I applied two coats of finish to the spindles, sanding between each coat with 600 grit sandpaper. The mattress frame is going to primarily consist of two beams that will span the inside of the legs. I made these from a piece of 6 quarter walnut. I jointed and planed them and left them as thick as possible.
and before moving on, I wanted to test their strength. Looks like each beam can support my body at the center of their span, so a pair of them will be plenty to hold whatever parent wants to be hanging out in the crib with their child. <laughs> The pins that will allow the crib to be disassembled are going to be made from a 3 quarter inch brass rod. I made a simple jig to hold the rod while it's being cut at the bandsaw. This is just a hole drilled in the offcut from tapering the legs. And that gives me a reference for the thickness of the legs. And I have the fence set so the rod is just proud of the surface. I'll clean up the saw marks and polish the pins with a buffing wheel. I'm starting the buffing with a cutting compound, and I'll remove the saw marks, and I'll also round over the edges so they'll go into the holes easier, and it will also hide the fact that they are not flush with the surface of the legs. To further polish the surface, I switch to a polishing compound and go over the ends again. Next I'll glue up the side assemblies. All these assemblies were a little goofy to try to get together because of trying to get all these spindles and holes lined up. To get clamping pressure across the angled rail, I use a pair of angled blocks. Normally I temporarily glue these on, but since I pre-finished the legs, that wasn't an option. So these just kind of slid around as I applied pressure. So I clamped from the top to bottom of the front leg, kept that wedge from sliding up and down, and blocks of wood against the lower clamp keeps the other wedge from sliding down. Now I can start putting the front and back assemblies together and bring them into the house for their final assembly. These could be a little tricky to get together. I found that working from one side to the other with the help of a clamp was the easiest way to go. Next I can work on installing the pins. I clamped across the rails so the shoulders would be as tight as possible and drilled the 3 inch hole through the tenons and then I could tap the pins into place. Next I'll install the mattress support rails. I used a spacer referencing off the bottom of the leg so the rails would be level. I transferred the whole location with the forcing bit since it has a center point and I couldn't find my 3 inch brad point bit. <laughs> I'm going to be tapping these holes for a 3 inch socket cap screw so I drilled the hole with the appropriate size hole for the tap I'm going to use. And I used a block of wood to help me keep the bit square as I'm drilling. Next I'll run the tap down the hole. Tapping wood is really easy with a drill, I just run the drill really slowly. To help strengthen the threads a bit, I drop some CA glue down the sides of the hole. And the same process with the upper position. I just did two positions for the mattress height for now. I figure if we need an intermediate height, I can always add some more holes in the future. After I got these bolted on, I gave them another strength test. The final thing I did was cut and install some boards that would span the rails to support the mattress. Pretty strong. So I'm really happy with the way this turned out, and I'm really happy with the subtleties in the wood. I know it's something that most people won't notice, but I know it's there, so of course I like that part. So this project actually took me a lot longer than I had anticipated it would take me. And that was really due to the spindles. The frame went together really quickly, just more than tenons, but the spindles really slowed me down. Just because there's so many of them and they took so much time each. Oh yeah? <laughs> but I'm happy I'm done with it. 
And I'm not going to make a crib ever again, probably, hopefully. So the reason I peg the front and back... What's going on? <laughs> so the reason I peg the front and the back is so that the upper and lower rails, as well as the spindles, can be taken apart as one unit and converted into a bed if you really wanted to. That way, all you have to do is add some new posts or some new legs to the bed, and then you won't have to worry about these big mortises in the top of the legs if you had picked it the other way and wanted to use the whole back assembly and front assembly as a headboard and footboard. Oh yeah? <laughs> so this is the last project for my nursery series. I previously did a video on making his changing table, which was just a small dresser, and I also made his rocking bassinet. Where are you going? <laughs> if you haven't seen those already, I'll leave links to those in the description as well. <laughs> so thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it, and so does he. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments about anything I showed today at the build, or anything back down in my shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking.